My name is Stuart Kaufman, and we're going to talk about very large transitions in the evolution of how we think of the world. So why indeed are we here? So let's turn to um, the human heart. What, most complex things will never come to exist in the non-ergodic universe at levels of complexity. Oh, by the way, there's what limits the complexity of the universe? And the comp molecules, essentially nothing. It needs some energy. Then why are there human hearts? And I started worrying about this a couple of years ago. And we, we already know the start of an answer, but we never think about it this way. Well, y we all have hearts. Uh, let me tell you what a Kantian whole is. It's, of course, named after the philosopher Kant, who said in around 1790, an organized being, then, has the property that the parts exist for and by means of the whole. Let me add, in the universe. The parts exist in the universe for and by means of the whole. You're a Kantian whole. So your heart is a part, and it keeps you alive. And all of the parts of you, your heart and your liver and your kidney and whatever, are what keeps you alive, but you keep all of your parts alive. You are, you are with your organs all the way down a Kantian hole. So this is going to turn out to be a very, very important concept, and it's Kant's from 1780. Okay, then, well, why are there hearts in the universe? We know part of it. Uh, we all have kids, and uh, we pass along by genetics and so on. Our children inherit our hearts. Our hearts are part of keeping our children alive, Selection acts on the level of the propagating individual, the whole. So whole organisms are propagating in the biosphere, and they're carrying along their parts. That's why there's hearts in the universe. Pretty amazing, huh? So there's something going on here that's not cute, it's fundamental. Hearts actually exist in the universe, fundamentally because life started, and complicated things like hearts come to exist, and they propagate, and they get to exist for quite a while in the universe. So it's something new. So that's going to get us to the problem of the origin of life. And I am going to tell you uh, some ideas, some of which are my own, about how life started. There's a standard view and there's a less standard view. Here's the standard view. Uh, we all know about DNA molecules, and it's the famous double helix. And when Watson and Crick first published the article, they, they, they said with typical on-purpose English understatement, it has not escaped our attention how such a molecule might reproduce itself. It's perfectly British. Well, you know, there's this, it's got the Watson strand and the Crick strand and the double helix, and there's little, little letters, A, C, T, and G, that stick out from the latter sides, and an A binds a T and a C binds a G. So if on one strand it's A, 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 C, 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 on the other strand it's T, 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 G, G, G. So from that you know that if you read the letters down one side, you know perfectly well what the letters are on the other side. It's the base complement. And that's how DNA replicates. It opens up and a molecule called, called a polymer, polymerase makes a second copy of the Watson strand, making a new Crick strand, and it makes a second copy of the Crick strand, making a Watson strand, and DNA replicates that. It has a cousin molecule called RNA, which can be viruses, for example, COVID right now, and that's exactly how RNA replicates. Well, people knew that 70 years ago, and one obvious idea for the origin of life is what's called a template replicating RNA, and Leslie Orgel and others have made single-stranded RNA, and the hope was that the single strand uh, would say CCGGCCAAUU, -U, uh, U replaces A in RNA, would line up the free little letter sides called nucleotides, and then stitch them together to make the second strand. It's a beautiful idea. And people have been trying for 60 years and it hadn't worked for a lot of good chemical reasons, like it tends to fold up into knots and precipitate. But it still may be right, and it's called the RNA world, and it's more sophisticated than that. So I'm going to tell you the idea that I had. It was really 50 years ago, and it came in a very strange way, and it's kind of fun. And I was wondering, well, you know, what if the constants of nature in physics were a little different, and you could get a universe and it could make complicated atoms but it couldn't make nitrogen and carbon and so on, so it just couldn't make a double helix. Now ask yourself that question, would life be impossible 
Well, as soon as you think about it, the answer is kind of obviously no. What do you need? You need some molecules and some reactions. It has to happen pretty fast. So we have to have things that can catalyze reactions, where catalysis speeds up a chemical reaction on its approach to equilibrium. And so I got to, in about 10 minutes, uh, what we need is a bunch of molecules, and they're connected by a bunch of reactions, and there's some stuff coming in from outside. And the molecules themselves can, can catalyze all of the reactions by which they're made. So I'm going to call that a collectively autocatalytic set. So here's an example. In the room with me are Richard and Lynn. So imagine that I catalyze a reaction that builds Richard out of two Richard parts. So I made a second copy of Richard. Richard's made, uh, catalyzes a reaction, growing together, gluing together two parts of Lynn. And I've got a, there's a second Lynn. And then she catalyzes a second formation of me by catalyzing two parts of stew to make a second stew. So that's a collectively autocatalytic set. Well, I've been in love with the idea ever since I had it. And I'm going to tell you something strange now and try to go into it more detail later. It turns out that if you take a complex mixture of molecules, typically there's a lot more reactions among the molecules than there are molecules. You can kind of picture that. If you take a polymer length 10, it has nine internal bonds, can be made in nine ways from littler things. So just typically there's a lot more reactions than molecules. So that means that if you take enough kinds of molecules in a pot, at some point, and then you say, you build a really silly model of who catalyzes what. You just say, let every molecule have some probability of one in 100,000 of catalyzing each reaction. So you take all of the molecules in your mind's eye or on a computer or in a real pot, and you assign at random what polymers catalyze what reactions on a computer. And what happens is when the whole thing gets big enough, there's so many reactions per polymer that so many reactions get catalyzed that the whole thing just gets connected. And thwam, a collectively autocatalytic set just crystallizes into existence out of this mixture. It's called the phase transition, and we can go into it further. But I want to hold it. Well, I can give you one more image that helps you understand it. This was done by 1959 and 60 by two mathematicians, Erdos and Renye. So this is, this is really fun. Uh, uh, picture a, a flat floor with no furniture in it, and 10,000 buttons on the floor, and a big spool of red thread. It has to be red, it turns out. People have never tried it with blue thread. So what you do is you break off a piece of thread, and you randomly pick up two buttons and tie them together and put them down on the floor. You break off a piece of thread, red, actually it does work with blue or any color, and pick up at random two buttons, tie them together, and put them on the floor, and just keep doing that. Well, at first, you'll have mostly individual buttons and a few tied together pairs of buttons. Then think about it. After a while, you're going to have little triads of three buttons tied together, then bigger clusters of tied together buttons, and then something magic happens. And let me define it this way. Every now and then, pick up a button and see how many buttons you pick up with it. The tied together bunch of buttons is called a component in a graph. A graph is a bunch of dots connected by lines. And it goes through an amazing phase transition. If I plot your way, here, from here to here, this is the ratio of threads to buttons. So it's 0 to 1,000, 10 to 1,000, 100 to 1,000, 500 to 1,000, 1,000 to 1,000, 10,000 to 1,000. So I'm just putting down more and more threads for a constant. And you pick up the biggest cluster, and here's what it does. Nothing happens, and then all of a sudden it jumps up. It's, it's like water freezing. It's a first order phase transition. There's a crystallization of this huge connected stuff. Can you imagine it? Okay, so it's Erdos and Renye. Well, what I told you about the emergence of an autocatalytic set is exactly the same idea, except rather than in buttons and threads, it's in a space of chemical reactions and who catalyzes what. It's mathematically, it's a hypergraph. I'm telling you something that we don't know, even though many of us have now been thinking about it for 50 years. Molecular reproduction can happen in a sufficiently complicated soup of molecules just because it's a phase transition, and it just does. I want to think life started that way. So I'm going to take us to the next step. I'm now going to show you that a small autocatalytic set already is a Kantian whole. So a collectively autocatalytic set is a Kantian whole. So let's come back to me and Richard and Lynn. Uh, so we are alone in the universe, of course we're not, and I catalyze the formation of Richard and Richard of Lynn and Lynn of me is making second copies. So 
I don't catalyze my own formation. I catalyze Richards, and Richards, Lynn, and Lynn, me. I get to exist because I'm part of this whole system of the three of us. But the whole three of us gets to exist because it's made up of all the parts. We, catalyzing one another's formation, are a Kantian whole. And it's the same thing as you being a Kantian whole with all of your organs. Can you see it? It's a very fundamental idea. It's not mine, it's Kant's. I've added to it the fact that you'll get them for free if you make a complicated chemical soup. Okay, so now we've got a Kantian whole. That was 50 years ago. Has anybody made an autocatalytic set? Well, the answer is yes. It, it took quite a while. My first book was Origins of Order, which I published in 1993. And in it, I said, I will buy a bottle of, uh, of champagne for the first person I meet who's made a collectively autocatalytic set. And about four years later, I was in, in Europe somewhere, uh, maybe somewhere in East Germany, with a wonderful man named Gunter von Kedorowski, a superb chemist. And he looked at me, we met, and he said, you owe me a champagne bottle. So I said, you've done it? He said, yeah. We, we shared the champagne, and he explained to me he'd made the first self-reproducing set of molecules. And what he did is he made, he had two little uh, six mers of DNA, uh, CCCGGG, for example, two little six mers, and each of the two little hexamers, as they're called, bound and glued together or ligated two fragments uh, that made a second copy of the second hexamer. So hexamer one makes a second copy of hexamer two by gluing together two fragments, and hexamer two makes a second copy of hexamer one by gluing together two fragments of hexamer one, just like just like I did with the Richard and Lynn. So he actually made a collectively autocatalytic set, and the champagne was good, and he got very well known for it. Well, uh, since then, uh, in 1995, see, DNA can bind its complementary pair. Uh, it has an axis of symmetry in the double helix. What about proteins? They just fold up and they don't have an axis of symmetry. Well, I had been hoping that somebody could do it with small proteins for my first papers on it, and in 1995, a man named Reza Gadiri made a self-reproducing molecule that's a little protein. It's 32 amino acids long, and it folds up in a coil called an alpha helix, which folds back on itself to make what's called a coil coil. And Reza reasoned, that's how you write in the paper after you lucked into it, that the whole 32 thing could bind together a 15 and a 17 long amino acid fragments that each made a little helix and hold them in place and glued them together. And it works. So Reza made the first self-reproducing protein. This is incredibly important. We've thought since Watson and Crick that molecular reproduction had to be based on DNA or RNA or some kind of polynucleotide. That statement's false. Peptides can do it. A postdoc of his, uh, uh, Gonan Ashkenazi, now at the Ben Gurion, made a set of nine peptides, and peptide one makes a second copy and catalyzes the formation of a second copy of peptide two. Two does the same thing for three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, and then nine makes a second copy of one. It is a collectively autocatalytic set of nine peptides. And it works, and it's in Gonan's lab. Uh, Niles Lehman uh, and his colleagues uh, several years ago took RNA molecules that can catalyze reactions, they're called ribozymes, and they put them in a pot with nothing but sort of cut in half ribozymes and some magnesium. You'll have to ask Lehman why magnesium. And they assembled themselves into collectively autocatalytic sets with three members, then evolved to four members and to seven members. So collectively autocatalytic sets clearly emerge and clearly exist. So far, nobody has done it yet with a set of random polymers. But there's hopes. So now let me go back. My thought for all of these years was that a collectively autocatalytic set would be made out of polymers. A polymer is something like a protein or a DNA or an RNA. It's, it's a lot of monomers strung together, like the 20 amino acids. But there was always the possibility that small molecules could do it by themselves. Frankly, I never thought of it until I was invited to join a paper as a co-author on work that I did not do myself at all. People were just being nice to me. The paper came out uh, this March 11th, 2020, in Proceedings of the Royal uh, Proctor Sock B, Proceedings of the Royal Society, uh, 
B. And the lead author is a brilliant young woman named Joanna Xavier. Her, her advisor, Bill Martin. I'm one of the co-authors. Uh, Mike Steele is a, an author. And Vim Hardick is an author. And it's really Joanna's idea. And it's beautiful. So you may know that soon after life formed, um, there, were, there were protocells. And then two kinds of organisms evolved, bacteria and a, another branch of life called archaea, which is like bacteria, but, but they diverged from bacteria maybe three billion years ago. No one knows. So this is a computer study that Joanna did. She looked at all the small molecules and their reactions in a bacteria from more than two billion years ago, before there was oxygen in the atmosphere, and an archaea from about the same period. And they're only looking at small molecules. There's no polymers. And there's things like little metal things, like iron sulfur complexes. And what Joanna found with Bill Martin and the rest of us delighted is that there is an autocatalytic set of small molecules, no polymers. And it's got about 1,500 molecules, small molecules, and iron sulfur and things, and about 1,500 reactions. There's a similar one in bacteria and a similar one in archaea, but they're not identical. They overlap in around 800 molecules. Well, this says something amazing. It sounds like molecular reproduction can happen without any polymers at all. And it looks like the two archaea and bacteria overlap in a set of 800, it's also collectively autocatalytic, that was there presumably before archaea and bacteria diverged from one another, maybe two and a half or three billion years ago. I find this just stunning, and uh, I'm thrilled. I'm very honored to be on the paper, and I, I promise you that I did nothing except say, gosh, that's wonderful. And I think this is something terribly important. It says to us, surely, no, almost surely, uh, a, a set of molecules of this kind can't reproduce. It needs no polymers. So this is in competition with the RNA world, which has been around since Wally Gilbert announced it in 1986. It turns out RNA molecules can catalyze reactions. They're called ribozymes. And it's a very brilliant idea that maybe life was based on just RNA molecules and template replication. And that's been the dominant view in the United States since 1986. Joanna's results, I'll call it the Joanna set, uh, in, in, in archaea and bacteria, make it very, very likely that life started with just small molecules reproducing sets with no polymers at all. Now I want to glue two things together. I told you that the Murchison meteorite five billion years ago had about 80 or 90,000 organic molecules and that Enceladus does now and that all over the universe there for five billion years ago, the universe had cooked up high molecular diversity of small molecules theory. If it's the case, that if you take a mixture of 80,000 or so organic molecules and some, some iron sulfur and so on, that it easily forms a collectively autocatalytic set. Theory hints yes, we haven't proven the theorem, but since there's a lot more reactions than there are molecules, it's very likely, but not proven. If it turns out to be likely that a mixture of that complexity just crystallizes in a phase transition autocatalytic sets, that are molecularly reprodux reproducing, we think about the origin of life everywhere in the universe in terms of molecular reproduction in a completely different way. Molecular reproduction, if that's true, is natural everywhere in the universe about five billion years ago. Well, how many, how many galaxies are there? 100 billion. How many stars in galaxy? 100 billion. So there are 10 to the 22 probable solar systems that's one with 22 zeros after it. If the probability of life starting on one of them is one in a million or one in a billion, there's an awful lot of biospheres out there, right? 10 to the 22 divided by 10 to the 6th is whatever it is, 10 to the 16th or something. There's an enormously large number of biospheres out there. We're not far from proving that this hypothesis is right. I'm going to tell you one more wonderful experiment uh, it started by, uh, it was started in 1954 by uh, Miller and uh, P the Nobel laureate uh, Ure. And uh, w Miller was a graduate student at Berkeley, and he was wondering about getting organic molecules that could start life 
here on the primitive earth. And he did a wonderful experiment. He took water in a beaker and he put into it three or four gases, methane and carbon dioxide and ammonia. Uh, and, then he sp and then he sparked it with electric sparks to mimic lightning. And he came back three days later and there was a brown scum at the bottom of the flask. And he analyzed it, it was all full of amino acids. Uh, you know, everybody interested in the orb like, was thrilled. He had made amino acids, therefore we could imagine how to get the molecules of life on the earth with lightning falling. So that's the matter Yuri experiment. We've later learned that they also came onto the earth by infall from meteors, so there's two sources of organic molecules. Amazingly, nobody returned to do the obvious next experiment until about three years ago. There's a man uh, named Albrecht Ott at a, a university in Germany. He's taken the Miller-Urey experiment, and he said, okay, I'll run it for a month, not four days. He is getting, by mass spectrographic analysis, 50 or 60,000 kinds of organic molecules. So he's doing in a month what it took the universe on the order of eight billion years to do, because everything's confined in the flask rather than floating around the universe. That means, roughly speaking, in principle, we can take Albrecht Ott's system and see if we get autocatalytic sets in it. A group of us is applying and has money from CERN to try to do that experiment. And you know, if it's yes, we'll be thrilled. But something like that's likely to be right. So I want to bring us then to the statement that it's now reasonably likely, not sure, but reasonably likely, that molecular reproduction is an absolutely natural expression of a universe that makes an ever-increasing and high diversity of things in a non-ergodic universe uh, that's type 3 non-ergodic. So now we've got our autocatalytic sets. All we have to do is get it to happen. Uh, so, uh, so we would like to do that. Okay, now we have Kantian holes and they've emerged naturally. Life is maybe utterly natural in the universe, and we may be able to know this in, in five or ten years experimentally. Now, hold that. Now I want to go back. So we were back with the hot cork glue on soup, and it was at equi equilibrium, and it was miserable because it couldn't do anything. It was just equilibrium. So there's no processes. Ma there's no macroscopic process when a system is at equilibrium. Well, what does that statement mean? Let's go back to the particles in the box bouncing around. Equilibrium means that, that macroscopic properties, like the average pressure against the wall, or the average kinetic energy of the particles, called temperature, stop changing. The little particles are bouncing around all the time. So the microscopic quotes degrees of freedom, which is the way the physicists talk, are changing. But there are large-scale properties, like temperature and so on, that aren't changing like the color in your coffee cup when you stir it. It's now just a creamy brown. Then there can be, no, at equilibrium, there can be no macroscopic processes. Pressure is not changing. Temperature is not changing. The color of your coffee cup is not changing. In order for there to be processes, whatever you're looking at has to be not in equilibrium. It has to be not ergodic. So there are processes, for example, when the universe is for the first time starting to make uh, protons and neutrons. And there are processes taking place in stars when uh, the universe is busy making atoms. There are processes when space chemistry is making ever more complex molecules. So let's just call that a process. And there are all these things, like water running down a hill is a process. OK, now I want to get to the notion of thermodynamic work. Ask a physicist, what, what is work? And he, the physicist will say, man or woman, uh, it's force acting through a distance, according to Newton. So you accelerate the hockey puck, and it's going faster and faster and faster. And that's the work done on the hockey puck. A fascinating book was written about 30 years ago by a man talking about the second law of thermodynamics, Peter Atkins. He said, no, it works much more interesting than that. It is a constrained release of energy into a few degrees of freedom. Uh, you look at him and say, I have no idea what a degree of freedom is, and I don't know what constraint is, and I have no idea what you're talking about. So here's what he's talking about. Uh, so picture a cannon and powder at the bottom of the cannon, and the cannonball uh, just a little bit towards the mouth of the cannon from the powder, explode the powder. The gases explode, 
If they weren't in the cannon, they would explode in a spherical cloud. But they're inside the cannon, so the only directions they can go in is along the tube of the cannon. A degree of freedom is a possibility for a physicist. So when the cannon is there, the, the release of energy in the explosion is released into the few remaining degrees of freedom given the cannon, and it blasts the cannonball out. So that's what's meant by work is a constrained release of energy into a few degrees of freedom. Is this clear? So just to make it concrete, suppose that you had a steel plate and the cannonball was sitting on it and there was a lump of powder next to it and you exploded the powder. Well, the cannonball wouldn't move very much. The release of energy is not very constrained. I, I think this is now clear. Well, I realized something about 20 years ago. I understood Atkins and I found myself asking a funny question. Well, first, let's see what physicists do. The cannon uh, is a constraint on the release of uh, energy into a few degrees. It's a boundary condition. It's the same thing as the edge of the billiard table, right? So what the physicists do, and this is perfectly fine, is they say, okay, here's this system, and it's got a cylinder and a piston or a cannon and a cannonball. I've got a fixed boundary condition for the cannon and a moving boundary condition for the cannonball, and, and they solve the equation, which is fine. But it doesn't answer a different question, which I found myself asking, where did the cannon come from? There were no cannons 13.7 billion years ago. Well, where did the cannon come from? Well, in the case of the cannon, we know. Somebody made the cannon. And it took work to make the cannon. And you get to a very strange cycle. At least sometimes it takes work to make a constraint that can serve as a constraint on the release of energy. And it sure takes a constraint on the release of energy to get work. So you get a cycle. No constraints on the release of energy. Sorry, no work. No work, often no constraints, so no release of energy that's a constraint, so no work. Let me call that the work constraint cycle. It may not be the case that it always takes work to make constraints, I'm not sure. If it did always, then it would be completely mysterious, but anyway, no constraints, no work, no work, no constraints. Well, I got that far 20 years ago, and I got a little bit further. I realized if work is done, the work could construct something that could serve as a constraint. Like the cannonball could hit a, could hit a, a, a pole and, and bend it over and flatten it, and you could use it as a tabletop. Okay? So work can make something that can serve as a constraint. And then I got stuck 20 years ago. I knew there was something important, and I didn't get it. Two brilliant young guys got it in 2015. Their names are... Uh, Ael Monteville and Matteo Mosio. And it's their concept, and it's constraint closure. Please take this in. It changes everything we know. And it's not me, it's them. So here's the idea. Hear it. Work is the constrained release of energy. So if there's a non-equilibrium process, like water flowing somewhere or whatever, for it to do work, it has to be constrained. So let's imagine three non-equilibrium processes. I don't care what they are. And to do work, there has to be some constraints. So let there be three processes, one, two, and three, and three constraints, A, B, and C. No pause. Automobiles are really neat. They do propagating thermodynamic work. The gas explodes in the cylinders, and the pistons go up and down, and it turns the crankshaft, and it couples to a bunch of gears, and the wheels go around, and the car moves. I'm going to tell you something that I find absolutely astonishing. Well, we make all kinds of complicated things. I mean, uh, we made chariots in, the, in, in Mesopotamia, and we make automobiles now, and railroad trains, and pianos. And we construct the automobile. The automobile doesn't construct itself. We do. What I'm going to tell you that is buried in this notion of constraint closure is cells construct themselves. And you must take this in. It changes how the world becomes. So here's their idea. I've got three non-equilibrium processes, one, two, and three. Processes one is constrained by a constraint A, and it builds something that happens to be a B. And B is a constraint, and it constrains process two, which builds something that happens to be a C. But C is a constraint, and it constrains the release of energy in process three, which builds an A. Pause and hear it. This is a system that does work because there's constraints on release of energy, 
and it constructs the very same constraints by which it does the work to construct itself. Can you, can you begin to feel it? This is a central concept, again, not mine. I missed it 20 years ago. Uh, so I'm going to say it again. I've got, I've got three processes, one, two, and three. Process one is constrained by A, a constraint, and it makes something called B. B conserved as a constraint. And it constrains process two, which makes C, and C can be a constraint. And C constrains the release of energy in process three, and it makes an A, and A can serve as a constraint. So work happens because there's constraints on the release of energy. Where do the constraints come from? This system uses the constraints on the release of energy that does the work to construct the very same constraints. It constructs itself. It doesn't describe itself. It doesn't chuckle. It doesn't get built. It literally builds itself. This is their concept of constraint closure. There's a set of processes, a set of constrained releases of energy, and a construction of the constraints on the release of energy that does the work to construct the same constraints. It's an astonishing transformative idea. I'm, I'm thrilled that they had it. So this is the concept of constraint closure. And we're going to see that it changes an enormous amount. So let's come back to Gonan Ashkenazi's collectively autocatalytic peptide set. And I realize, my goodness, Gonan set reproduces, it achieves what I'll call catalytic closure. Every reaction that needs to have a catalyst does. So all the reactions get catalyzed. So it's kind of a holistic task closure. But it also realizes constraint closure. Well, let's persuade off ourselves. Gonin feeds in the little pieces that will be built into his peptides. So it's an open thermodynamic system. Uh, and peptide one binds two fragments of peptide two and holds them close together and acts as a catalyst by holding them close together that lowers the activation barrier so the two peptides are glued together forming a peptide bond. Well, that took energy, so work got done. But the first peptide is an enzyme, but an enzyme's a boundary condition. It's just another boundary condition. We don't think of it that way, but it's exactly a boundary condition. It holds two things close together, so the three-dimensional three -dimensional motion of the two little fragments is reduced to zero, they're right next to one another. So peptide one is a boundary condition. It makes, it does work to make peptide two. But peptide two is a boundary condition, and it does work. It does the constrained release of energy. Peptide one, when it makes a second copy of peptide two, is precisely doing the constrained release of energy into a few degrees of freedom, which is the construction of peptide two, rather than some other wacky reaction. Can you begin to feel it? So this autocatalytic set of peptide is simultaneously collectively autocatalytic. It has, a, uh, it has a, a catalytic task closure, and it achieves constraint closure. So I have something more now to add to the notion of a Kantian whole that we didn't have until a couple of years ago when Matteo and Amile came up with this. Living Kantian holes construct themselves. Isn't that astonishing? Cars don't. Nothing we make constructs itself. Living cells do. And this is now going to lead in amazing directions. So, so now I've got this idea of constraint closure. Every cell in your body is a collectively autocatalytic system and achieves constraint closure inside of the cell. Next step. I just published this in an article in Entropy called Answering Schrodinger's What is Life? So here's Newton and his laws. And remember we said that the boundary conditions create the phase space. So I happened to realize this by playing peewee golf about a half a year ago, a year ago, and it was just this big concrete floor, and there was these very long wooden beams, six inches by six inches, and maybe 10 or 12 feet long, and they were arranged parallel to one another, and then went at angles with little boards jutting out to create the holes. And of course, you know, if you're used to it, I, I too got trapped in the windmill, but that's because I'm 80. Uh, but my grandson didn't but that's good. The boards are boundary conditions, and just like the billiard table, the boards that are the boundaries of the table create the face space of possible positions and momenta of the balls on the table. The boards on the ground are boundary conditions and create the possible positions and momenta of the little golf ball. Let's go back to the billiard table. 
if you put the uh, balls on the table in some different initial state, it's in the same phase space. If you change the shape of the table, you change the very phase space of the system, right? It can go and be in different places than it could if the walls of the table were where they were before. So changing the boards, changing the boundary conditions, changes the actual phase space of the system. Next step. Newton tells us his laws of motion. The boundary conditions are totally free. They could be anything. They could be a cannon. So what cells do is, no, I want the notion that the boundary conditions carry information. So here's the, uh, here's the, uh, the peewee golf course, and I, want to, and I want to say it explicitly, a given board carries information because it could have been different. It specifies this phase space because it's there, but if, if the boundary conditions were somewhere else, it would create a different phase space. So a changeable boundary condition, arbitrarily changeable boundary conditions, carries information because it's here, not there. So boundary conditions are causally efficacious, but they're freely changeable, according to Newton. Well, we're almost there. Cells construct proteins. The proteins are boundary conditions. They construct different boundary conditions. So a cell is constructing its own ever-changing boundary conditions, right? Then it's changing its own phase space and what it can go do and be. There's lots and lots of chemical reactions. And now we have to have something strange. I'm going to go a step beyond it in a moment. In physics, oh, hold where we are. We were back at the uh, quark glue on superequilibrium. Then we said you have to have processes. To have processes, you have to be non-equilibrium. But once you have processes, there can be things that speed up or slow down the processes. Right? So constraints, so processes are releases of energy, like gas expanding into a room. Once there are processes, there can be constraints on those processes. The process is a release of energy into a large number of degrees of freedom. If there's constraints on that release of energy, then work is getting done because there's something like boundary condition constraints. In all of physics and chemistry, is there, there's no case that I know of where the system constructs its own constraints. Living cells do. And that's going to lead to the fact that there is no entailing Newton-like laws that describes what organisms go and evolve and do. They change their own phase spaces. In physics, there is a, in a strange way, a pre-stated phase space. It's something like the Hilbert space of the whole universe. And you can have a Hilbert space of the whole universe, as Marina Cortez told us, because you have a fundamental theory of physics. It's a standard model. And given that fundamental theory, there can be all the possibilities ahead of time. When when systems can build their own boundary conditions, you can't say what the possibilities are going to be because if they can change their own boundary conditions arbitrarily, if they can, and I'll get to that in a minute, then you can't say. Well, can, they, can a cell change its own boundary conditions arbitrarily? You bet. So, you know, there's DNA and RNA and, and so on. And, you know, there's quantum mutations. So quantum mutations are ontologically random. So you get a new protein with a, a different amino acid. Due to the mutation, the cell has just changed its boundary condition in some way. You couldn't have said what it was. And then it either works or it doesn't work for the cell in its world, so it's selected or not. Uh, so that comes to exist in the universe. Uh, I, I hope I'm conveying this. I'm going to come back and say something else that makes it even stronger. But let me give an example. Fruit flies have mutations. And one mutation, the, the eye of a fly is red, omatidia, and there's a mutation called white, that changes the color of the eye to white. It happens to be recessive, but suppose it was dominant, so one copy did it. Uh, and uh, let's imagine that a quantum mutation happens in some red-eyed fly, and uh, it, it, or its egg, or sperm, and now there's a white-eyed fly. And for reasons that we can't imagine, but for some reason, the white-eyed fly does better in its environment than the red-eyed fly. It's fitter in the Darwinian sense. We can't say why it's fitter. We just find out that it's fitter. And 50 years later, there's an awful lot of white-eyed flies uh, flying around Davis, California, which has a lot of wine. 
And what has come to exist is this funny new DNA molecule and protein in the universe, non ergodic universe. And we can't say why, we can't deduce that it's there. We can't say that the quantum event happened. Gr granted that, the fly is a classical object, that it's fitter or not is not just classical, it has to do with fitness. So 50 years later, there's this funny molecule in the universe, and we cannot deduce that it's there. Uh, so, okay, so now let me, so let me say this part. Then I'm going to get to th something that I'm finding even more striking. Because cells can change their boundary conditions, they can create their own ever-changing face spaces. And living systems, life constructs itself. The biosphere constructs itself. I'm going to harp on this as we go on a little bit further. But there was early life three and a half billion years ago. And now there are living organisms all over the place that have gone from protocells to bar bacteria and archaea to eukaryotic cells to multi-celled organisms, to the Cambrian explosion uh, with, with uh, turtles and frogs and T-Rex and the mammalian lineage and us and a hell of a lot of bacteria underneath the place and under rocks. It's an explosion of things that keep making themselves and therefore they keep changing and making what is possible for them to do next. They evolve into what I will call the adjacent possible of the biosphere. The adjacent possible is what is next possible given what's actual now, and you can't pre-state it. So let me try to show you that. I'm going to show you that in a way that will lead. I want now to get to the fact that we can't even say it ahead of time. Uh, and I'm going to do it by telling you uh, the screwdriver argument. It's very strange, but it's kind of fun. So here's the screwdriver, uh, and I hand it to you. And I say, I'm going to name you Bill. Bill, please tell me everything you can do in New York, just before the pandemic in, in uh, 2020, uh, everything you can do with a screwdriver and anything else you want. And the question is, can you list all the uses of a screwdriver? So let's try. Well, I can screw in a screw. I can unscrew a screw. I can snap open a can of paint. I can bash open a can of paint. I can scrape putty off the window. I can scrape paint off the window. I can use it as an objet d'art. I can stab somebody, I can scratch my back with it, I can use it as an electric connector between things. Uh, I'm, I'm fond of the fact that I can tie it to a stick and spear a fish. Then I can rent the spear to the locals and take 5% of the catch. And I really like leaning it against the wall, leaning a piece of plywood on it, and putting a wet painting underneath it to keep the painting dry. So how many uses of a screwdriver are there? Uh, is there a specific number of uses, like 16? Well, that sounds nuts. Is there an infinite number of uses? Well, that sounds nuts. And also, uh, there's no iterative procedure like n and n plus 1 uh, to count them. So I want to say, and see if you agree with me, there's some number of uses of the screwdriver, but it's indefinite. It's not definite. Why? Why is it indefinite? Well, what we do with screwdrivers, we try them in funny situations, and we see if they work. And maybe they do, and maybe they don't. And if they work, the answer is yes. And if no, no. And if, what counts as good enough? Good enough is good enough. It's not definite. Life is not definite. So hold that. Next point. There's four ordering scales in mathematics. Uh, a nominal scale, just the names of things. An interval, an ordering relation of x is greater than y and y is greater than z. So x is greater than z. It's transitive. Uh, uh, an interval scale like a thermometer. Two degrees above zero is more than one degree by the same interval, but zero doesn't mean anything. And a ratio scale, like a meter stick, where your two meters is twice one meter. Well, what kind of scale are these the screwdrivers? It's just a nominal scale. That means there's no ordering relationship among the uses of screwdrivers. Those two things mean, I think, that there is no rule-following procedure. This is essential. There's no rule-following procedure, an algorithm, that specifies precisely what's supposed to happen. There's no rule-following procedure that can list all the uses of a screwdriver with things and other things, or deduce the next use of a screwdriver. But that happens all the time in evolution. So I know how to say this. I've said it before. Some molecular screwdriver in some bacteria finds a use that makes the bacterium fitter in that environment, 
and that new use comes to exist in the bacterium, and that new use is a new function that keeps the cell alive. I didn't define function, so let me make the point and come back. So the new use of the screwdriver is a new function. So what's a function? So let's go back. I should have made it before. The function of your heart is to pump blood. And that's what keeps you alive. Your, your, your heart also makes heart sounds and jiggles water in your pericardial sac. That's not the function of the heart. So once you've got a Kantian hole in the non ergodic universe, you can define a function. It's the causal consequence of a part that keeps the whole sustained or alive. The others are side effects. Physics can't distinguish between subsets of causal consequences. It can say all of them. Once you have Kantian holes, you can define the function of something. So the function of the screwdriver is some new causal consequence. And I have finally understood, even though I made up the screwdriver years ago, how, so, how puzzling this is. So we, the English speakers know what an engine block is. If you open your car, you've got a big engine. The way you make engines is you take a big block of steel. It's about 8 inches or 10, 12 inches or 13 inches long and 8 inches high and 6 inches across. And you drill cylinders in it by drilling holes and then you're going to build an engine. Well, let's start thinking of things you can use an engine block for. So I'm going to tell you the story of the invention of the tractor, which I hope is true, but it makes the point. So it's 1920 and it's in Texas because people in New Mexico can tell Texas jokes. And these guys are trying to invent a tractor. This is before there were women engineers, or there's a woman there. It's not a sexist joke. It's a true story. So they have this huge engine block, and they think, we're going to have to put it on a chassis. And they put it on a chassis, and it breaks the chassis. They put it on a bigger chassis, and it breaks the bigger chassis. They put it on an even bigger chassis, and it breaks the bigger chassis. And one of the engineers says, you know, the engine block's so big and rigid, we can use the engine block as the chassis. And that's, in fact, how tractors are made. And Formula racing cars used to be made that way. Well, what just happened? The engineer saw a causal feature of an engine block, its rigidity, that could be used for a different purpose, namely to be a chassis. But an engine block could also be a really neat paperweight, a little excessive. You could also crack open a coconut against the corner of an engine block. If you polished the side of an engine block and made it shiny, it could be a mirror. If you carved it out so that it's hollow and parabolic, uh, it could focus sunlight and you could cook something with it. So let's list all the uses of engine blocks. Well, we can't. It's like the screwdriver. But now comes the mystery. What happens in evolution is new uses of things come to, come to be selected all the time. Life stumbles upon new uses of things and they're grafted into evolution. They're Darwinian pre-adaptations. So the, the molecular screwdriver happened upon a new use that helped the, the bacterium. And now whatever that causal consequence is, it's a new function in the biosphere, right? So new functions are emerging, which means that, here's where we were with Giuseppe Longo and Niall Monteville a number of years ago. It means that the phase space of biological evolution, which includes functions, is changing all the time. So we can't state the phase space. So we don't know what the relevant variables are. They haven't come to exist yet. So we cannot write down equations of motion. So we can't integrate the equations of motions we don't have. So no laws whatsoever until the becoming of a biosphere. With this, we are beyond the Newtonian paradigm, which is spectacular. And it's been a a spectacular stricture for 330 years. We're beyond it. And I made. a chassis. It's possible it can be used as an engine block. It's possible it can be used as a paperweight. It's possible it can be used to crack open coconuts. Those statements, first of all, are true. What's the ontological status of possible? I think the possibles are real one point. But the other is the following. Is there any kind of deductive relationship among these uses? Suppose the engine block is being used as a chassis. Can you deduce that it can be used to crack open coconuts? No. Can you see any way to deduce that it can be used to crack open coconuts? Deduction requires propositions and quantifiers like all and some. It requires some equations of motions like Newton's that you integrate. 
there, there seems to be no way to get from any one use of an engine block to deduce lots of other uses can actually come to be. But that means, again, that the way the biosphere becomes is through radically different uses of actual physical objects that can have different uses that come to be useful to evolving organisms, Kantian holds, that can build them. The organism can build it, and it becomes useful. It's an antenna or a bump, like clams have bumps on their surface to keep starfishes off. Well, what the heck? So this means something that I'm finding increasingly stunning. Life very likely existed uh, when we got molecular reproduction. Uh, a molecular, small molecular reproduction that already has Kantian, has a Kantian hole. It's already doing work. It's already got constraint closure. It's already building its own boundary conditions. It can evolve somewhat, even before it has DNA and RNA. Uh, we know that these eukaryotic cells can evolve. And it's not described by any law for the reasons we've just said, which means a radical freedom beyond the entailing laws of Newton. So we're on our way home again in a new way. We're going further, but we've gotten this far. We started with the specificity of, of the berry. Berry become all that is. Then we got to the specificity of uh, Odysseus. Uh, and his men got killed. His men killed, stole the cows and killed them. And Zeus got really angry and killed them. And it's personal and specific and embedded. Then we got to water is everything, then earth, air, fire, and water, then Democritus, and then to Newton. My colleague Giuseppe Longo says something that is utterly profound. He says the objects in physics are generic. Mass is generic. It doesn't matter what you're made of. You have the same mass independent of your constituents. And then Giuseppe said, life is utterly specific. And it is. It's specific. And the reason it's specific is that living things construct themselves out of real, right now, physical objects in three-dimensional space. Specifically, this works with that. I haven't gone to the interactions between organisms. We're going to get there. And it's that organisms make things like bumps and dents that are going to create bi biosemiotic communities as we communicate with one another. We're going to get to co-evolution. We're not there yet. Weinberg says the more we know of the universe, the more meaningless it is. If I'm a living thing, if I'm a Kantian whole in the non ergodic universe, getting to exist is the name of the game. I exist for some time in the non ergodic universe, and therefore there's the notion of good for me or bad for me. It's me. This is food. That's good. That's toxin. That's bad. So once there is a Kantian whole, Value enters the universe. We've gone from matter to mattering. For that bacterium, it's good for me or bad for me. My wife Catherine says the same thing. So that bacterium ought to be able to do something. It ought to be able to sense its world, evaluate it good or bad for me, and act in its world. So we're getting to agency. My wife Catherine says that triad is emotion, and that it's the first sense. She may well be right. So now mattering has entered the universe, and myriads of organisms have emerged and make their livings with one another, which we'll look at more in the future. But just to say it, um, we're a mixed microbial community now, or three and a half billion years ago. Your flat surfaces affords me uh, something to crawl on to go get some food. So we're going to get to the notion of affordances and maybe I dribble some glucose on you. So we're going to get to organisms creating affordances that they trade with one another in the ebullient unfolding of a biosphere. That trading is the economy. Uh, it's there in the biosphere. It's there in self-consistent biosemiotic communities. And the biosphere is absolutely teeming with meaning and mattering. And actually, I'm sure Weinberg knows about it because he's got a family and he likes dinner. So we've gotten from matter to mattering. We don't have consciousness yet, but we've got an awful lot. We're beyond entailing law and we're beyond Newton and the Newtonian framework.